morning, church. It's a wet morning, and nice to see all of us this morning. We praise the Lord for each one of you. Um, that the warmth of the blanket did not hold you back, but you chose to be found in the house of the Lord. There's no better decision than that decision. That's what David said, that all he desires is to be found in the house of the he knows when things get thick to be found in the house of the Lord seeking of the Lord's counsel and wisdom is the best thing that you can do so this morning I'm born again my name is Peter Macharia I was telling some people out there they know me as Peter Wairago but I don't use Wairago because that's my dad's name and Anne will be called Mrs. Wairago so <laughs> she, she doesn't want to be called Mrs. Wairago so yes but feel free you can always call me either of the names um, and I'm blessed this morning I'm grateful to God for the gift of life the gift of salvation and the gift of health there are many things that we take for granted but once you know what it means when somebody wakes up in hospital when somebody wakes up and things are not the way they left them yesterday we have a lesson every morning to be thankful to God this morning I want us to look at a topic, the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God. I would like the media team to put for us the book of um, Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles, chapter 32, 1 to 15. Second Chronicles, chapter 32. 1 to 15. Because I said I'm of the old time religion, when the Israelites came from captivity, there was a priest that accompanied them. After Nehemiah, we go to who? To Ezra. Ezra was teaching the people of God the word once again, because for 70 years they had been away. And knowing that the kings who reigned before then, there was a lot of mess and so forth. Therefore, Ezra told them, when reading the word of God, we do what? We start. So let's start and read the word of God. Great, and we can start. After Hezekiah had faithfully carried out this work, King Sennacherib of Assyria invaded Judah. He laid siege to the fortified towns, giving orders for his army to break through their walls. When Hezekiah realized that Sennacherib also intended to attack Jerusalem, he consulted with his officials and military advisors, and they decided to stop the flow of the springs outside the city. They organized a huge work crew to stop the flow of the springs, cutting off the brook that ran through the fields, for they said, why should the kings of Assyria come here and fight plenty of water? Then Hezekiah worked hard at repairing all the broken sections of the wall, erecting towers and constructing a second wall outside the first. He also reinforced the supporting terraces in the city of David, and fractured a large numbers of weapons and shields. He appointed military officers over the people and assembled them before him in the square at the city gate. Then Hezekiah encouraged them by saying, Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria or his mighty army. For there is a power far greater on our side. He may have a great army, but they are merely men. We have the Lord, our God, to help us and to fight our battles for us. Zechariah's words greatly encouraged the people. While King Zenacharib of Assyria was still besieging the town of Rakish, he sent his officers to Jerusalem with this message for Zechariah and all the people in the city. This is what King Zenacharib of Assyria says. What are you trusting in that makes you think you can survive my siege of Jerusalem? Hezekiah has said, The Lord our God will rescue us from the king of Assyria. Surely Hezekiah is misleading you, sentencing you to death by famine and thirst. 
Don't you realize that Hezekiah is the very person who destroyed all the Lord's shrines and altars? He commanded Judah and Jerusalem to worship only at the altar, at the temple, and to offer sacrifices on it alone. Surely, you must realize what I and the other kings of Assyria before me have done to all the people of the earth. Were any of the gods of those nations able to rescue their people from my power? Which of their gods was able to rescue its people from the destructive power of my predecessors? What makes you think your God can rescue you from me? Don't let Hezekiah deceive you. Don't let him fool you like this. I say it again. No God of any nation or kingdom has ever yet been able to rescue his people from me or my ancestors. How much less will your God rescue you from my power? Please, you can have your seat. You can see... <laughs> Before I, 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 I go back to this, on, on Monday, either Monday or Tuesday, uh, somebody sent me a text about all the taxes, a WhatsApp message about all the taxes that will be levied against us. And had painted the picture, again sent away about the appointments, the last appointments that had happened. And, and, and you know, on the TV, there's also whatever else that we know that is being discovered down coast, isn't it? And that evening, I was really, my, my emotions were very, very affected. I, 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 you know the way you feel you, like you're crushed? I, I experienced almost a moment like that, that Jeremiah, when he was writing Lamentations, experienced. When you are not seeing how tomorrow will be or how next year will be, because things look a bit doomed. And you know, when you engage yourself in self-pity, many a times you forget about who has brought you up to where you are, who has taken care of you, even when we knew that you couldn't walk inside town because it was filthy and there were people who could grab you with human waste and tell you you have to give us whatever you want. You remember those days? Some of us may remember who were there during those days. That God who delivered us those days, that God who delivered us during other times when things have been very thick in this country, at that point, I had forgiven. I had forgotten. And the following morning, I was telling my wife, I had a bad dream because I was in a building that was falling. And the building came crashing. But by the grace of God, I was able to jump from one floor to the other. And then I was walking on the streets and things were going on normally. And the whole day, it was not very easy. In the evening, I was sharing with her. I don't know whether it's the morning or the evening. And then later on, I looked at what had been going on before. My thoughts process. And I realized that sometimes we bring ourselves to a state of hopelessness of losing hope, of feeling desolate, of feeling like the world is coming to an end. But in the dream, God showed me, no matter what is happening, I will take you through it because there is a God who knows our tomorrow. There's a God who knows where we are coming from and where we are going. Hezekiah found himself in a situation that was unprecedented. Now, go back to the previous chapter. Chapter 28 of Second Chronicles. Of Second Kings, chapter 16, where you hear the story of Ahaz. Ahaz was the father to Nehemiah, uh, to Hezekiah. Ahaz inherited a kingdom when he was 20 years old. And the Bible says that he ruled for 16 years. That means that he died at that six years. But Ahaz did everything contrary to what his father David. Now, if you look at the king's reference, it's always the father, David. 
That was the SI unit. God studied that he was assessing every king against. And um, Ahaz had failed everything, including sacrificing his own sons, including worshipping false idols, including erecting the, the Asherah poles, and any other evil that a king could do. And he had, when he was about to be attacked by the king of Israel, he was called King Pekah, and the king of um, Syria, he decided to build alliance with the king of Assyria. You get the distinction between Syria and Assyria? Assyria would be equivalent today to part of Iraq, part of Iran, Kuwait, and part of Turkey. But Syria, we know, Damascus, where it is. The king of Assyria was a very powerful king, and therefore he was able to crush Israel, and he was able to crush Syria, and he was able to bring in the king of Judah, Ahaz, under his own rule. So, is Judah that was initially an independent state now had to pay homage to the king of Assyria. Because of the actions, because prophet Isaiah, who was the prophet at that time, had told him, go seek your help from God. Do not seek your help from who? From Assyria. And even Isaiah had told him, why don't you ask God for a sign? But I have said, I don't want to test my God. You can see how holy he was. He doesn't want to test his own God. And therefore, he was rescued from Israel and from uh, Syria by the king of Assyria. But after that, he had to keep on paying annual um, homage to this king. At one time when he visited Damascus, now, the capital city of Assyria was Nineveh. But because they had conquered Turkey, they had conquered Syria at that time, he had also now a home in, uh, in Damascus. When he went there to visit, he saw the way they were worshipping God. And it looked like more just here than the way in Israel they were worshipping God in the temple. And therefore, when he was still there, he sent measurements to rear the priest and told him, I want you to create an altar like this. So that by the time I come, I want to come and worship in that altar. So Uriah the priest had to make that. And the king led the people into worshipping idols. Into worshipping all the other gods. Such that the people were so unhappy with him, that when he died, he was not buried in the tombs of the kings but he was buried in the city of David. And his son, Hezekiah, took over. That is why when we read the Bible, it is starting by telling us, let me go back to Second Chronicles, chapter 32, verse 1. Second Chronicles 32, verse 1. After these things and these acts of faithfulness, no, before then, we can have a look at chapter 20, 20, 29, because we say Second Chronicles 28 is all about Ahaz's reign. 29, Second Chronicles 29, Hezekiah became king in 715 BC, and we find that in verse 3 of chapter 29, Hezekiah cleanses the temple. That was the first thing that he did. The temple that had been closed, the temple that had been made filthy, the temple that had been distorted, the first thing that Hezekiah did was to cleanse the temple. In the very first month of the first year of his reign, Hezekiah reopened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. Even the doors had been destroyed by his own father. And then, when you go to verse 20 of 2 Chronicles 29, and maybe you can put it, 2 Chronicles 29, verse 20. Early the next morning, King Hezekiah gathered the city officials and went to the temple of the Lord. Uh -huh, let's go ahead. They brought seven bulls, seven rams, and seven, 
and seven male lambs as a burnt offering, together with seven male goats as a sin offering for the kingdom, for the temple, and for Judah. The king commanded the priests who were descendants of Aaron to sacrifice the animals on the altar of the Lord. This had not been done during the reign of his own father. So we see in verse 20, Hezekiah restoring the temple worship. In chapter 30, chapter 30, you can go to first, Second Chronicles chapter 30 from verse 6. This is where we saw the Passover being celebrated. At the king's command, runners were sent throughout Israel and Judah. They carried letters that said, O people of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, so that he will return to a few of us who have survived the conquest of the Assyrians. Go ahead. Do not be like your ancestors and relatives who abandoned the Lord, the God of the ancestors, and became an object of derision, as you yourselves can see. And on and on, he was gathering people from both Israel and Judah to come and celebrate the Passover feast. Passover, which was reminding them of what God had done to the children of Israel during captivity, for them to be delivered from Egypt now to the promised land. And the people, they had, if you go to verse 8, he says, do not be stiff naked as your ancestors were. Submit to the Lord. Come to his sanctuary, who has, which he has concentrated for, consecrated forever. Serve the Lord your God, so that his fierce anger will turn away from you. If you return to the Lord, then your fellow Israelites and your children will be shown compassion by their captors. And will return to this land, for their Lord your God is gracious and compassionate. He will not turn his face from you if you return to him. He is even concerned about the children of Israel who had been conquered. Remember, he was the king of Judah. But he sent now messengers to go even to Israel to tell the people, come, let us worship in the temple. Let us come and celebrate the Passover because this is what is expected of us. It had not been done for a long time. This was the third thing that Hezekiah did to be able to bring back the people of God. Chapter that one talks about the restoration of the priesthood and organizing the priests. Chapter that one restores the priesthood and organizes the priests. So the priests that had been ignored, now he commanded the people who were staying near Jerusalem, near Jerusalem, to go and and pay tithes and all that was expected of them, so that the priests and the Levites can find their sustenance. They can focus on worshiping God and leading the people of God through what was expected of them. These are things that were happening. And when he heard that the king of Assyria, remember at this time, because the father had given the kingdom to Assyria, they were paying annual remittances. And now Hezekiah has come and has removed the gods of Assyria. He has removed the, temp the, the worship from the high places that was taking place. He has restored the worship in the temple and restored the priesthood. And he knew the king of Assyria was going to attack. So he decided we are not going to pay what we have been paying. We cannot continue as the chosen generation, as the people of God, we will not continue paying to those heathens that which God has given to us. But if you go now, what he thought at that particular point because remember, we learn a lot from our own fathers. We learn a lot from our own forefathers. Remember, when we are looking at the story of Isaac, we say that he also did some mistakes that the father had. He lied just like his father had, and he wanted to go to Egypt just like his father had, until God tells him, no, stay here. That's why he had to redig and the wells. And we are told that Isaac, because of obeying God, he planted and reaped a hundred fold. Now here, the king was about to do the same mistake like his father. When you are being conquered, when you are being attacked because you have refused to pay, he decided 
let me go to the Egyptians and they will come and help me against the Assyrians. But prophet Isaiah tells him, so he sent an embassy to Egypt asking for help. Isaiah opposed this alliance with Egypt and called it a covenant with death. That is in Isaiah 28, verse 15. He warned against the revolt by declaring that an alliance with Egypt would be a disaster to Judah. In Isaiah 30, verse 1 to 3, Isaiah 30, verse 1 to 3, in New um, Revised Standard Version, O rebellious children, says the Lord, who carry out a plan, but not mine, who make an alliance, but against my will, adding sin to sin, who set out to go down to Egypt without asking for my counsel, to take refuge in the protection of Pharaoh, and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore, the protection of Pharaoh shall become your shame, and the shelter in the shadow of Egypt your humiliation. Prophet was very categorical with him. It's either you seek your help from God, or if you go to Egypt, that Egypt will become your shame. And I was just imagining how many times have we left the comfort of the protection of God and we have gone to seek assistance from fellow human beings? How many times have we believed if I don't have this kind of support, if I don't have at all relative, I cannot be able to get that promotion. If I don't give in to him or to her, at this stage as a young person, he may look for somebody else. I may not get married to him or her. How many times have we decided that unless we bribe, we cannot get that tether? We cannot get that opportunity. This is what Isaiah was warning King Hezekiah against. Do not go to seek help from Egypt because that will be your own shame. That person that we know, if we go and give in, they'll give us that promotion. That will be our shame. If we go and do contrary to God's will, because we have been taught and we know what God expects of us, the ours is to hold God to his own word and call unto him and allow him to lead us and to define our tomorrow. Because he's a God who knows where we are heading to. You know, I, I, I have a miss. I remember one time, some years back, Pastor Aris was preaching here and she said, if you're going to Nakuru at night and you put on the lights, do the lights see Nakuru? No. God allows you only, or your lights can only allow you to see up to a particular. But do we stay worried that we can't see Nakuru from here? Why are we worried so much about the future that we know it is in the right hands? Why can't we say, God, today you have provided. Even tomorrow, you will meet my needs according to your riches in glory. Because he is God. And that is what we are being asked. That is what Isaiah was telling Hezekiah. Hezekiah, unlike his father who refused to listen, he decided to do according to the will of God. So he never went to Egypt. He decided we are going to stand. So Sennacherib, what we have just read, decides to conquer. And by the time he was in Rakish, Rakish was about 25 kilometers from Jerusalem. And he had already captured 46 of the big cities of Judah. And they had all been fortified. But this was a big army. He had overrun everything. So Sennacherib now comes outside. But you know, Ezekiel did not just sit. And he decided to prepare. Second Chronicles 2.30 says, Ezekiel dug a tunnel and rooted the water from Gihon Spring into the city. All it says to the spring, but when you search, you find it is the Gihon Spring in the city. First, he decided, why should they come and fight our waters? And they drink. We can root all this water back into the, into the city. And archaeologically, the tunnel has been found. In 1880, archaeologists found that tunnel that Ezekiel dug. I told you the other time I'm a church historian and I'm also a historian, so I like understanding the history behind it. So I even went to the archaeological findings so that you get evidence that actually these things were historical events. So he has rooted the first thing. 
The second thing we see, is we see in Second Chronicles that 2, 5, Hezekiah built up all the wall that was broken down and lays the tower. That means when we know the enemy is coming, Ephesians chapter 6 tells us what? We have to put on the full armor of how do we prepare? Because tomorrow we don't know how things will be. We have to be like Hezekiah. The enemy will surely come. But then, how do we stay fortified? How do we make sure that we are all protecting ourselves against the future that is coming? It is to make sure that we have put on the full armor of, let's read the word of God. Let's be in prayer. Let's know what exactly God wants from us. So, he rebuilt the walls. And then we see in 2 Chronicles 2, 5 to 6, Hezekiah made weapons and shields in abundance, and he set combat commanders over the people. He set combat commanders over the people. The people could see. Although the people could not see outside how big the army was, if inside you don't make people feel confident, you know, in our own homes, you, we, we cannot let everybody know we, 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 can't, we, don't, we don't have anything to eat. Do the children care? The other day, Anna was telling me, it's good to be a child. That you don't care whether dad and mom will get. And we'll even get school fees. All they know when the day comes, you will. When the boys want to get married, they will come and tell you, dad, I have out. Now, it is upon you to know how to tell them. How shall we go? That is what being a parent is, yeah? The, the, my, 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 one of my colleagues in office, the father has been unwell with cancer. And uh, it has been a journey for them. So recently developed complications and he had to be taken back. The other three, nobody has any interest in what is developing. It is her who has all the, you know, the connection with the father. So she's the one who had now to ask for permission to work from home actually to work from India, as she rushed the father to India. So, before she left, she was telling me, how I wish I was still a child. This burden would not have fallen on, on me. And at the same time, the sister to the father is in KU with another cancer complication. And that sister did not get married, does not have any child. So who is a child who is taking care of? It is still this young lady. So rushing, make sure the sister is settled, and so on. And I have to tell her, just put your trust in God. These things can be overwhelming. These things can make you lose hope in life. And these people, it is the hope that you have. It is the faith that you have that they will hold on to. That is why sometimes Bishop says, if you have no faith, hold on to my. When you feel down, just remember that there is a God in heaven who cares. We normally say that these challenges that come through our lives are just sometimes great opportunities for us to see the greatness of our God, for us to see what our God is able to do. In 2 Chronicles 2, 6 to 8, Hezekiah encouraged the people. You know, he had to start and really encourage the people because the whole kingdom, people have gathered in Jerusalem there are others you know, your relatives who are in other cities, like Rakish and so on. They have all been conquered. And now, it is upon, it is time for Hezekiah to encourage the people. Um, so, if you go to seven, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him. For there is a greater power with us than with it reminded me of the day that Arameans attacked Israel or Samaria. And the prophet uh, Elisha was with his servant or his helper. And the helper wakes up one morning and finds they have been surrounded. You know, you wake up one morning and you find you have nothing. You find there's nothing. Everything is gone. And you're wondering, how do I move on? That is why, the, I, 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 if I am correct, 
the thing of the, of, of the song, it is well with my soul. The story is, he sent his wife and the children to go ahead of him back to England. But when they were on the way, the boat or the ship capsized. And all of them died. And when he got the news, he was a prominent lawyer in the U.S. When he got the news, he said, it is well with my... He could only turn to God. Because do you go mad or what do you do? People will say, they have an answer. Go and be told, familia yenu. I'm the person behind all this. Must be so and so and so and so. And you start on a journey that you know cannot end well. But him, he chose to say, it is well with my soul. Here the king is. And he's seeing he has been surrounded. And he's encouraging the people, telling them, telling him that those who are on our side are more than the ones that are them, they just have motto, mere men. But for us, we have the heavenly army. We have God with us. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. You know, with him is an armor fresh. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and fight our battles. And the people believed. Actually, first, that 2 verse 8 says, And the people took confidence from the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. They trusted their king that God is going to liberate them. Because Judah was a small tribe. And like Israel, which were the ten tribes, this was just two tribes. It was a small tribe. So, um, there will be those times when we feel we have been besieged. When we feel things are not working on our way. Sanacharib's message was very scary. And we see, the first thing that he did is to undermine God. What does he say about God? Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord. No God can save you. He compared the Almighty God with the works of, of men. You know where he says, not even God. No God. And he compares them. See what we did. What my predecessors did to the other kings. There was no God that was able to survive. When the people of Ashdod rose early, the, the, uh, when I was looking at this, I remembered what happened when the children of Israel were fighting against the Philistines during the days of uh, early the priest. And the people said, we can actually go with the Ark of the Covenant and the people of Philistines will run away. But they told themselves, we shall fight like men. You know, let's fight like men. And they fought and they conquered the children of Israel and they took the Ark of the Covenant back to Ashdod. And that is when the message, when it reached Eli, the Bible says what? Eli fell down and broke his neck and died. Because he was told that even your two sons have also died. But God had not stopped working. That when they put the Ark of the Covenant next to their God, Dagon, what did they fight in the morning? Dagon had fallen. They restored Dagon. And the following morning what they found was that the ribs had been broken, the hearts had been broken, the head from the neck had also been broken. They actually only found the body. That's when they realized we cannot keep this God here. This is so strong a God. And now we have Sanacharib saying that not even God can help you. You know, they will tell you not even that church that you normally go to, not even the God that you worship in can they stop from you because they have money, because they have tall relatives, because they have all the powers that they might think about. But for you, as long as you have God, the God of heaven, then you can walk confidently knowing that God will fight your, your battles. The second thing that Sanacharib did, he undermined King Hezekiah. The people's hope is in the king. But Hezekiah is saying, do not he let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you out of my own hands. The person that you thought is your last hope, the last studying, the last one studying, the king, the last one that you are trusting in, they have said, even that one cannot help you. First they have undermined God and says, no, 
not even, no God has been able to start against us. Secondly, Hezekiah is just deceiving you. He cannot start. The third thing, he promised to them abundance in slavery. Make your peace with me and come out to me. Then each one of you will eat of his own vine, his own fig tree, and drink the water of his own cistern. The enemy comes and they will make promises look so promising. They will tell you, if you just only accept what I'm telling you, then everything else will work out for you. Why are you being difficult? Just give this amount of money. And the, the, what I've realized, one of the worst things in this country is if you want to trade with the government. You know? And you go to the, the county government and they tell you what you do. First give us this amount of money. And then we shall clear for you everything else. A friend of mine uh, they had traded with one of the county governments where I come from during the previous government. Now, the new governor has come and he thought things will be okay. And he reaches out. He had done some road construction, had not been paid. Now, he is, he's, he's, he's not like you. He's a, a man of the world. So he had already paid a bribe to the previous. Now, the old governor has gone home. The new governor has come. So he could not see the governor, so the following morning he was told the governor will call you. The governor calls him and tells him, you know we have too many bills and the government is not giving us money. So what we want from you is you can give this amount of money, and it's not a little amount, give us this amount of money, then your papers will be brought to the, to the top. So that when we start paying, you'll be among the first ones. So now we had gone, a meeting of old boys. We had gone, and the guy is telling us, now, who do I do? I had already paid. And now they're asking me to pay again what I don't have. Already by paying that. And for you to be competitive, you had really given the lowest of the prices. How do you make it from there on to the next stage? So it was, I had to tell him, you chose your own bed, and you have to lie on it. Because he can see where he's, he's, he's going to make the money. So I told him, don't pay. Let them stay with it. Because even if you pay, it will still be a similar story. The Sanachari promised to take people of Judah to a lad like your own. So why are you removing us from your? A lad of grain and new wine. A lad of bread and fine yards. A lad of olive trees and honey. Choose life and not death. That's what he's telling people. He's the one who owns life. Choose life and not. He tries to instill deep fear in the people with threats. That is what the enemy will come because they must make you be so ahead. Quickly, let me look at some of the lessons that we can learn from this because I see time is not on my side. Now, the first lesson that was very painful to me was that, uh, and, and I'm sure painful to many people, Serving God fully does not exempt us from trials and tribulations. Remember we said Hezekiah had restored the temple worship. Hezekiah had restored the Passover, the, the Passover celebrations. Hezekiah had restored the priesthood. Hezekiah had done many good things and worshipped. In fact, the Bible says there was no other king who did good since the days of David like Hezekiah. But you see what? That is exactly what he says. And one writer says, God did not permit the pious prince to be disturbed till he had completed the reformation which he had begun. That yes, although we are believers, challenges will come our way. Temptations will come our way. Tribulations will come. Secondly, as Christians, we face off against Satan and his army of demons who are constantly aiming their bows at us, with their fiery darts aimed right at our most vulnerable areas. Like Hezekiah and the people of Judah, we have two choices to make. Saleda in defeat, or allow God to fight for us. You have a choice to make. Either you allow God to fight for you, or you Saleda. Hezekiah chose God to fight for him. 
Just as Ezekiah strengthened himself so that he would be ready for the battle, you know, all the things that he built, built up the wall that was broken, added another wall outside, repaired another fortification, and made weapons in abundance, we cannot forget the words or what the Bible asks us to do. Put on the full armor of, of God. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, shield of faith, helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And number four, the fourth lesson, we must always remember that who is on our side is greater than those on their side. Challenging situations are opportunities for God to show himself strong and mighty. I, I, I remember the song that we used to sing in our college days. In heavenly armor, we enter the Lord. The battle belongs to who? The battle belongs to God. Those were the words that Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 was told by the prophet in verse 15. That do not worry, for the battle is not yours. The battle belongs to who? The battle belongs to God. You know, in the mornings when I have woken up, that tells you it's not every morning, when I have woken up maybe at three or two and I have prayed, and in the morning I wake up feeling refreshed, you know, power packed, you know, as you are going around, as you go to work, and you're looking at the people, and sometimes I remember the words of a book in sales, that they say that the sales team would come together in the morning, and they would be charged, they would be prayed for, they would be uplifted, that as they walked out, the, the, the general public would not know the kind of power these people are with. And they would go and make sales. That was the first time that sales was done in the U.S. Now, when I'm walking around and I'm wondering, these people, have they, do they have an idea of the, the guy who is driving this car? You know, the God who is on my side. Because situations, sometimes you must look back and say, the one who is backing me up, the one who is on my side, the one who is fighting my battle. That day, I'm normally blessing people. I'm not cutting other cars, you know? I'm just blessing people, bless you, you know? <laughs> because you can tell what there is. And for me, I decided I'll make a habit. Once I walk into the office, and I try to get in the office earlier than my colleagues, and that has been a habit for many years. When I walk into the office, it is for me to make declarations. It is for me to take charge of that office. So the situations, whoever will come, and that is why they will calm those who look like they can eat people. But when they come, I will calm them down. And I'm telling you, I have had experiences because they have been working for many years now. But I have said, even if whoever it is, bring them to me. You know, when everybody else is worried and wondering, I them bring them to me. Going sometimes to meet hostile students, and they, they're almost rioting. And I know, oh, in the morning, I called to the king of kings, and I will walk in, and I'll tell them to come down. Now, tell me slowly by slowly. One mother was almost fighting my staff. So I told her, please ask her to come now to the office where I was. And she came, and she poured so much, you know, vitriol, all those things. And then I told her, now, you know you are speaking so fast. I didn't get what you are saying. Why don't you take a seat? Now, tell me one by one so that I can write the points down. Do you think she will repeat it in the voice she was, she was in? You must have called your God in the morning as you walk out in your business because they will come. And they will come demeaning you, making you look like you are nobody, but you must know who you have called. And that is why in the morning when you wake up and you have not really prayed and trusted God to read your direction, how will the day be like? Every day, make it a habit. Let's put our trust in our God. Fear and desperation should not make you leave God's shelter. David in Psalms 25, verse 4 and 5 says, One thing I have decided of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in times of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He set me up upon a rock. That is what the greatest of the kings knew. 
that the best thing that he can do is to be found in the house of the Lord. Is to have God with him. At times when you go and there is all that that is being prayed because me, I'm a farm believer, I'm, I'm a morning person. So in the morning, I must be right. So even what I will put to listen to, maybe it could be some message that has been preached. Listen to her fallen in love with my husband. I never used to listen to him when he was alive, but it is now listen to that I've fallen in love with him. And I'm listening to him. I'm soaking in so that I am armed as I'm getting into where I'm going. Because I know that when God is on your side, nothing will be impossible. No office, no person will not um, be, 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 or be able to overcome you. Alvin Slaughter sang a song, Our help is in the name of the Lord. You know? And I still remember, even here, we used to sing a song, Blessed, yeah? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Ne be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Most high. The second part is more important. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are saved. A strong tower, the righteous run into it, and they are saved. We have a name that we can run to, even when situations look totally impossible. Even when the government is declaring tax after tax, even when we are not so sure how they shall implement the NHIF or even the new houses that they're not promising you that you'll be able to get, there is still a God in heaven that will make things work better for you. And that is why, I remember last Sunday I was telling people about we are still going to Israel. I told them that when the bishop told, reminded me this year, I was wondering, bishop, do you understand and then God reminded me, whose report will you? And I chose to believe the report of the Lord. Because the report of the Lord says, it is well. The report of the Lord says, he shall provide. The report of the Lord says, nothing is impossible with him. Our God shall make it possible for us. That is the report that we must go to, must, must work with. I'm sure there are people who are wondering, are we still digging and restoring? Because things the way they are looking... But it is individual. It will not be the country. God is not controlled by the economics of the country. He is not controlled by the politics of the country. Our God has his own economics. And those are the ones that we should, because whether you like it or not, there will be people who will dig and be restored. When we come in this here, people will give testimonies of what the Lord has done in their lives. Will you be one of those who will be speaking? Or will you be the one who will be saying, oh, things have been very bad? What happens, happens to us all. It is the decisions that we make and who we believe that will make a difference in our lives. Choose you see this day whom you shall believe. The one that will go ahead of you in every situation. God will keep every promise that he has promised his children. That is lesson number six. And we can see it because in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 20 says, For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen the glory of God through us. God will keep every promise that he has promised. And lastly, God is our great savior. And a cherub arrogantly proclaimed that God cannot save. It took only one angel, one night, to destroy his army. They woke up the following morning and 185,000 soldiers laid dead outside Jerusalem. And Sennacherib had no choice but to go back. God saved Hezekiah. He has continued to save his people and he still saves us and will continue to save us. There, 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 there's something that comes, there's a song that comes to me every time there's a situation and sometimes it comes to me even before the situation comes in. And I know that, I always know that that is God who is speaking to, who is speaking to me. Now that song is in my mother tongue. The, 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 so please, I'll interpret if I can remember. 
Jehova madhani kumo kia berelia. Dalea, elia dugata shake. Tagiro no tani muige. Gumona ugoshi rogu shokerera. Let me tell you, my friends. Every time that song comes, even when I woke up this morning, and I woke up when it was raining, must have been around five something, that was the first song that came because there was this mountain here. <laughs> but every time, I actually, that song, I find it coming to me, and me, it is the most difficult situation that our Lord God, from the beginning, has never forsaken his own people. He has never left his own people. Why will he start by leaving you this time? Our God, he says, do not lose hope. For I will be with you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Amid these challenges that we are going through, there is a God. And I want you to take some time and look at Second Kings chapter 19, and you can see the prophecy that Isaiah gave to uh, the prophecy that Isaiah gave to the, the, the to the king. Let me just touch just a little bit. In verse 20 of chapter 19, Second Kings 19, verse 20. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Your prayer to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. This is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning um, against him. Virgin daughter Zion despises you and mocks you. Daughter Jerusalem tosses her head as you free, you know the tossing of the head because the hair is long. I um, can see like Pastor Esther there tossing the, the and this is amid this, the challenges. But the, the, the prophet is now saying how Zion is tossing the head. You know that is in despise, it is looking down upon Assyria, the mighty kings, hundreds of thousands of army out there. But the prophet is saying that the daughter of Zion is just tossing her head as she walks around. And you know, as you go down. Um, I think it's in 29. And this shall be the sign. The sign for you this year. Eat what grows of itself. Now he's telling Hezekiah. And this shall be the sign. The sign for you this year. Eat what grows it, of itself. And in the second year, what springs the same. Then in the third year, sow and reap and plant vineyards and eat their fruit. And the surviving remnants of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and hear and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and out of Mount Zion a bird of survivors, the zeal of the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city or shoot an arrow there, or come before it with a shield, or cast up a siege against it. By the way that he came, by the way he shall return. And he shall not come into the city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it. For my own sake and for the sake of my servant, David. And that night, the age of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people rose in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went home and lived at Nineveh. And as he was worshipping in the house of Nisroch, his god, Adramerech and Sharezer, his sons, struck him down with a sword and escaped in the land of Ararat. And as Ash, had done, his son laid in his place. When you despise the Lord, when your enemies despise the Lord, these are the consequences. That that king who was saying, not even God, no God can stand before me. He laid dead. His own sons killed him. And as the prophet had prophesied, not even a single arrow was pointed to Jerusalem. God just sent one angel 
and killed 185,000 military, top military officers. And the children of Israel, the children of Judah, could rejoice in their Lord. What a deliverance. What a God that we serve. What a God that owns our lives. What a God that walks before us in every situation. Could there be situations that you have been wondering, God, where are you? God is telling you, I'm still here. Call unto me and I'll answer you. I'll show you greater things than you have ever seen. That is what God says. He still is in heaven. And he's taking care of our businesses. Every morning, he looks at you and says, my child, you are still precious before me. It is only you who can reject God. But for him, he is willing to fight every battle that is on your side. Could you be having a situation that you may want us to pray together? You can just start where you are. It's that situation that you are trusting God to change in your life. Could it be there? We can start and trust God together because he's a God. And I'll ask my wife to come and pray with us. And you are the wife of the preacher. You also get the privilege of the platform. <laughs> Every situation, what we need is to put our trust in the mighty God. And him who could conquer a big army of a small country called Judah, he can conquer for you. We only need to put our trust in him. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, in the name of Jesus, we stand in your presence. This morning, we thank you for your word that has come so strongly unto us. We thank you that we belong to you, that we can boast of sonship in the kingdom. We've been bought by the blood and we can address you as our father. And this morning, with our heads bowed and we stand in your presence, with all our issues that are like mountains before us, but we thank you that you are a God who never forsakes his own, a God who is on our side, a God who has never lost a battle. You are a man of war, and therefore in all our circumstances, we know that you are fighting for us, and we know that we are more than victors in the name of Jesus. And therefore, Lord, for every heart, for every soul that is looking up unto you, we declare victory in the name of Jesus. We ask that, Lord, you would give us the patience, you'd give us the faith, you would remind us of where you have brought us from the past, so that, Lord God, we will stand and watch and wait as you fight our battles. We thank you for victory. We choose to trust the report of the Lord, that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. The situation in the country may not be looking favorable for us, but we know whom we have looked up to, oh God. In our jobs, in our businesses, in our families, in our health issues, we know that we are more than conquerors. For we know whom we have believed in. And we are persuaded that you are more than able to take us through. We thank you for victory and we embrace your victory and our victory by faith. For this we ask, trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen.